Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field on the program today. Uh, Philip Lorea, a financial advisor, poet, and writer of Minute Dot. Uh, Jason McPhee, engineer for the state of California. Welcome to the show. We're on the, uh, on the web at www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on cable channels all over the place. So uh, tune us in at 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday every week. In the Chinese uh, province of, correct me if I'm wrong on the pronunciation, Xinjiang, uh, in the northwestern corner of, uh, of China, of mainland China, uh, there is a group of people called the Uyghur Muslims. And again, pronounce, correct me if I'm wrong on the, on the pronunciation, but I'm, I'm going to assume that I'm close to right. Uh, Xinjiang province is actually the largest province of China. It's huge. Uh, it's mountainous in, in much of, uh, of its area, but uh, there's a, an area in the southern part of the province which is agricultural and it's been uh, uh, populated by Muslims, Uyghur Muslims, from time immemorial. These are people who have uh, a Turkic language, not Chinese, not Han Chinese. Uh, back in 1949, when the, uh, uh, the communists took over China, the uh, population in Xinjiang was about 7-8 percent uh, Han Chinese, the rest the, the native Uyghurs. Uh, now it's something like 40% uh, Chinese, uh, Han Chinese. Uh, you know, they're still a, a minority. The Uyghurs are still in the, in the majority, but it's obvious that because of oil and natural gas resources, among other things, that the, and, the, uh, and the, the routing for the, the new Silk Road, that the, the Han Chinese have taken a great interest in their western, northwesternmost province. And as a result, they are imprisoning hundreds of thousands. According to the BBC, they're imprisoning hundreds of thousands. I say imprisoning. They're sending hundreds of thousands of the uh, Muslims to re-education -edu camps with guard towers, barbed wire, and uh, watchtowers, and 24-hour uh, you know, guards. Re-education camps. They're being imprisoned. Uh, and uh, they're being done so on the basis of whether or not they practice their religion in the way that uh, they have traditionally done so, by fasting during Ramadan, by wearing full beards, by uh, the veil, you name it. They are being forbidden from doing a lot of those things on pain of being sent to these camps, to these uh, re-education schools, to learn the proper Chinese communist socialism with a a Chinese uh, uh, flavor. Uh, thoughts? Well, th this is you know one of the, the problems. <coughs> whenever you have a, uh, a state that relies on uh, central command and control, it, uh, it wants you to worship G O V, not G O D, and um, it's it's uh, it essentially it's it's something that's competing for authority, and, and it, you know it, the. The, the state can't have people looking toward, uh, you know, other people for guidance. It really has to have people <clears throat> following its own structure. And China's, you know, certainly, even though they've, they've done a lot to, to open up some market elements into their economy, there's still a lot of control. And, you know, one of the interesting things we I, I remember reading about lately was uh, they have this new uh, social um, wellness score or something like that it's called where they're looking at your uh, they're tracking all their citizens with these millions upon millions of cameras in their country and if depending upon how you behave where you go if you say negative things about the government you get um, you know you get demerits and if you get enough demerits you can't get uh, you can't get on the airplane you can't get on the airplane uh, you know you, you start to get things taken away from you whereas if you uh, do all the things the government wants you to do, you get express treatment. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not just the, the, the Muslims. In, uh, in Chengdu, uh, recently, 100 Christians were arrested for not going to a government-approved Christian church. Uh, in Tibet, the uh, Dalai Lama has been essentially replaced by a Chinese Dalai Lama, or, or uh, coming up Dalai Lama. Uh, and the, Dalai Lama, the actual Dalai Lama has been in ex exile in India f for most of his life. Uh, and uh, the uh, offerings that devout Buddhists make to the uh, in the Buddhist temples uh, go to the government. They don't go. They don't go to the religion. Uh, I, I visited Tibet uh, last year, and uh, it's very, very clear that the Chinese, the Hans, the uh, Eastern uh, Chinese, have moved into Tibet as well as uh, Xinjiang, 
and they're in the process of making sure that you toe the communist party line, not the Buddhist party line. We visited a, uh, a, uh, a house out in, you know, the, the, the yak herder house uh, up, uh, up in the mountains. And, you know, it's a, it's a modest house, and every Buddhist house in Tibet has a room which has a whole bunch of little Buddhas and, you know, prayer uh, paraphernalia and so forth. And this home ha had that room. But next to the Buddhas were three pictures, one of Mao, one of, uh, uh, of uh, Z, and one of somebody else, uh, uh, Deng, I think. Anyway, three Chinese, the three uh, 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 iconic Chinese communist leaders. They, those pictures had to be there with the religious symbols. And you could tell the family was a little bit uncomfortable with that, but they paid lip service to it. And they said, you know, these are our leaders, and, and uh, you know, when, when asked about it. It's insidious what they're doing. They are essentially saying that if you don't believe in the Communist Party religion, because that's really what it is, you don't get to participate in our economy or you'll be sent to a uh, re-education camp where you'll learn to participate in the economy. And uh, it's, it's, it's not a pretty thing. Well, China is kind of in an interesting place when you think about it. I, you know, they've been being pulled in some ways towards markets, but if you look at right in their neighborhood, you have North Korea, which is the closest thing you could get to 1984, uh, you know, in, in, in actuality. I mean, some people have said that 1984 was a roadmap for that country. <laughs> so uh, I, I just, uh, uh, so I mean, you I'm know. I'm not sure that they have the technology to do it as well as China does. <laughs> well, but they, certainly China does. Yes. Well, it's funny, too, when you mentioned uh, what goes on in their houses, I remember there was a documentary with, I think it was Lisa Ling uh, for National Geographic years ago, and it was on uh, North Korea, and they, they went into a model family's home at that time, and as they went through the home, uh, you know, they, they, one of the first things that struck them is there was no pictures of family on the walls or anything like that. It was only pictures, all kinds of pictures of the deer leader. <laughs> pictures of the deer leader riding a horse, picture of the deer leader, you know, <laughs> doing, doing whatever. And, and, and it was, and she had the presence of mind to ask one really sharp question. She said, which, which, which one of these pictures do you like best? And they looked at each other with some alarm, and they said, we like them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they didn't have to write, look at a picture of, of Putin uh, riding a, a horse. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we laugh and we lament what's going on in China. But in Phoenix, Arizona, the city council, in their infinite wisdom, passed an ordinance saying that if you are selling accommodations or services to the general public, you cannot discriminate on among other things, uh, sexual orientation uh, or uh, anything like that. Now, as libertarians, we don't believe anybody should discriminate on sexual or orientation. I mean, if somebody, if a gay couple comes to my, if I, if I were to own a, uh, a wedding chapel or, a, or a, a bakery or something like that, I would say, you yeah, know, pay the money, take the cake. Well, you know, I, I have no problem with that. But there is a couple of people, a couple of women, Joanna Duca and uh, Brianna Kosky, who own Brush and Nib. And what they do is they do uh, hand-written or hand-calligraphed uh, wedding invitations, among other things. And they uh, looked at this law, and they're, they're unwilling to write a, a wedding invitation for same-sex weddings. They just said, you know, we're Christians, we're not going to do that, we don't believe in it, we're just not going to participate in that. But they looked at this law and saw the $2,500 per day fine as well as the uh, threat of six months in prison, and said, you know, we don't really want to take that risk. So they sued the city of Phoenix to get the law changed. The uh, Maricopa County uh, Court uh, overruled them, uh, and so did the uh, Arizona Court of Appeal. This is in, fight of, in spite of the Masterpiece Cake Shop, which uh, happened in Utah, which uh, was a U.S. Supreme Court decision, 7-2 decision, saying that you can't force a baker to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Well, this is very similar. You can't, you know, forcing calligraphers essentially to write wedding invitations or hand draw wedding invitations for a gay wedding. Um, they are, in fact, the city of Phoenix is, in fact, saying you cannot freely exercise your religion if you want to do business in our state. Well, uh, you know, this has been, uh, you know, that conflict between what is what. What is someone's um, uh, civil liberty, 
namely to choose who they do business with or don't do business with, uh, versus what we, you know, just feel in our conscience feel is right about how people should behave. And so it becomes, um, I, you know, the classic has always been, do you defend uh, do you defend the Nazis' right to speech? I mean, there's nothing more repugnant to many people than the Nazis. Do you defend their right to speech? And the ACLU originally did, not and, so much anymore. So, you know, I think that um, uh, the slippery slope is that when you start saying this is what we say is right and this is therefore the law, uh, where wh what is the limiting factor? The and, difference is between coercion and persuasion. Right. In the case of the Chinese communists, they believe in the, you know, in the benefits of the Communist Party. And it's, a, it's almost a religious fervor with mm -hmm. which the, uh, the communists believe in what they're doing, probably, uh, more than likely. And they are saying, we will force you mm -hmm. to believe what we believe. If you don't, you're going to get re-educated until you mm -hmm. believe what we believe. It's not a matter of persuasion. They're not saying, hey, you know, this is what we think. You know, take a look at it, see if you, you know, might want to, uh, you know, change your attitude a little bit. It's not persuasion. It's coercion. Same way with Phoenix. Phoenix is saying, we don't think that you should be discriminating against people that are uh, have different sexual practices than you do. Shouldn't do it. Personally, I agree, but I don't think I should be able to hire politicians in Phoenix or anywhere else to say, you can't. Mm -hmm. You must follow my moral strictures. I can talk until I'm blue in the face to say to these two women to say, "Hey, this is not a very you know this is not a good business practice. This is not a moral thing to do. This doesn't accomplish anything as far as uh, pro, you know uh, for, for furthering your religion or your, your religious mm -hmm. views. It's just going to backfire on you." But I can't say you must or I'll throw you in jail. Mm -hmm. it's, co it's persuasion versus coercion. Well, this, is, this is a sad thing, too, because you know, it, it all comes down to, you know, if, if we are free, we have to be free to associate and we have to be free to be stupid. And, I mean, if, if somebody else gets to tell you what you're free to do, then you aren't really very free. <laughs> and, you know, one other sad thing about all this, too, is, it, you know, historically, if, you, if, if people would, would really look at some of these examples that we have, you know, when we allow market competition, that is the bane of irrational discrimination against uh, uh, people. I mean, uh, it, professional sports is an absolutely wonderful example of this. Uh, you know, you look at Jackie Robinson and how he broke the color barrier in baseball. And the reason he was able to do that is because there wasn't a law prohibiting companies or, or the, these um, uh, teams from taking on a black player at the time, even though there were Jim Crow laws in the South and such. Uh, you know, the, the National Baseball League did not have a law against it, and so a team was able to experiment. They said, hey, here's a, a guy we think he can help us win. There's no law against it. We're going to try it. And sure enough, within a decade or two, all the teams had black players on them. And by the time the Voting Rights Act occurred, uh, you had overrepresentation of black people in the sport of, of baseball, and we've seen that in all the sports. And it's all about competition. You know, if, if, if you want to be the irrational bigot in the end, you're going to suffer. And, and so certainly some of those owners must have been irrational bigots at the time, but they all came around. And, and we even saw that with that uh, uh, owner of uh, the Clippers a while back, too, you know, who, who made some racist statements uh, be, behind. But, you know, he was hiring black players, <laughs> you know. And the, the issue was, even though he may have had some racist ideas, uh, behind the scenes, the bottom line was, in the marketplace, he didn't discriminate. So, well, and it goes to other issues that we're talking about. You know, very much in the news with the social media and how should we regulate what they're showing or what they're not showing, and that whole thing. And um, you know, finally, you you have no choice but to have it come down to the market. So you can try to regulate, but good luck. You you regulate that, and it shows up as something else elsewhere. It, it has never worked that way. What works is to not give them your business. Well, what works is to. Uh, relegate government to protecting people, not coercing people into doing what you think is the utopian uh, way of doing things. Well, and, the, and the crazy thing is that sword cuts both ways. And when Jim Crow was in effect, if you were a train railroad company, if you owned a, a diner, 
you would be punished by the government if you allowed integration. You know, so I mean, in, you know, there, there were some places where they. Oh well, yeah, it was illegal. They were, they were in many cases following local laws. Exactly. So I mean, you didn't even have, even if you wanted to uh, experiment, if you wanted to compete, you know, uh, open this avenue of competition as an entrepreneur. You couldn't because the government was telling you you couldn't. So, I, you know, and that's the thing I think a lot of people don't recognize is that if you want that government solution, you got to wait till over 50% of the population is, has the same idea you do. Whereas if you just, you know, say freedom of association, allow people to compete, you can bridge these gaps so much faster than just waiting for government to come along and do it. The U.S. population is growing at the slowest pace in 80 years. What's that all about, Philip? Uh, poverty. <laughs> okay. Next, expand. Uh, 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 what has happened is big, uh, that family. I thought we were in a big, a big recovery. We, oh, we're certainly not. We're actually heading into a recession, and everybody knows it. Uh, but the problem has been when you look at those eighty years. Uh, look at the last time it was that bad. It was the Great Depression. Uh, what has happened has been, uh, yes, you have very this amazing wealth. But the poverty rate has been rising all along, such that California now has the highest poverty rate in the nation, despite having some of the wealthiest people in the nation. Uh, so, and in spite of having the most progressive tax. Yeah, uh, let us say, uh, they're all leaving. But what has happened is people simply can't, especially it's not so much the poor, because among the poor, a person is an asset. Uh, not only, I'm not speaking of the social programs, which is somewhat true, but they literally are an asset. They can help. Uh, in the middle class that has become more accustomed to their comforts, a child is an expense and they start looking, oh my gosh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. They're taking away my time, they're telling me I gotta plan for college, and uh, you know, my retirement account won't be so big, and blah, blah, blah. And so it just becomes a choice where, uh, you know, we, when I grew up, uh, I came from what was considered a small family in my neighborhood of only six siblings. I was one of the smaller groups. If you weren't in double digits, you, didn't, you weren't cutting it. Uh, now the average household size is um, uh, 3.7, meaning two adults and a, a kid and, you know, maybe another kid. And of the anemic population growth there was, we actually lost U.S. citizens. We had some small immigration. What growth we had was from immigration. Uh, we actually lost U.S. citizens. U.S. people left. So when you think about, uh, there is a great saying that I subscribe to uh, in economics, which is, demographics is destiny. So when you have an aging population and you do not have a population replacing that population to be productive, all of that kind of thing, then what happens is that society will fail. It must fail. Uh, the mathematics of it, uh, yes, it takes 30 or 40 years, but look at a great example of uh, demographic destiny is Detroit. It took 40 years for it to die. But the demographics of what they created, the disincentives they created to live in Detroit and to produce in Detroit and all of that, the population ground down. I believe that the peak population was a little over two million in Detroit. And by the time it completely collapsed, it was about a half a million. And so if you want to know what has happened to our population growth, it has everything to do with the incentives and disincentives and, you know, in one word, population. So you're saying that the uh, population, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, decrease in population growth is primarily a middle class, probably lower middle class phenomena. It's people saying, I would rather buy a vacation in Hawaii than uh, junior's private school education? Middle class on up. Okay, upper middle class. On up. Okay. So you don't see, uh, and, and indeed the wealthy, mm -hmm. uh, because you don't see... Um, the, when you think about what it means to have a large family and the kind of commitment that that entails, uh, and now the financial commitment, I'll just give you an example. My father, single income, was a manager at a place, not an owner, not a wealthy man, uh, single income, six kids and a wife. Uh, we all went to uh, the local Catholic schools, and that was doable. And I sat down as an exercise a couple of years ago, I thought, what does my father need to make today? to live that exact same lifestyle. Those schools are still there, the whole thing. And he would need to have been making a quarter of a million dollars a year 
in a job that currently, if someone were to have that job today, they would maybe make $75,000 a year. So it goes to show you what has happened over a 40-year period of the impoverishment of, you know, we hear about the wages not growing okay, for 50 years. Okay, does that have something to do with the, I, I, I've, I've seen graphs that show what's happened uh, as far as income disparity starting in the early 1970s. Uh, what, what's happened is productivity growth has continued to go up, at, you know, very steadily, but wage growth has plateaued, mm -hmm. has not, you know, basically is, is flat. From, if you take a look at it, look at it in real terms, yeah. going back to 1971, yeah. when we officially went off the gold standard, mm -hmm. does it have something to do with uh, the financialization of the economy that occurs because of, uh, <laughs> because of, uh, of. Uh, uh, Federal Reserve policy? Well, you boy, you just put your finger on it. Let's talk about what's happening today, yesterday, and the day before. Uh, the Fed, on a daily basis, is commenting on how it must suppress the economy because it's afraid that wages are growing uh, because the labor force, it says the labor force is tight, wages are bound to grow, and if those wages grow, we're going to have inflation, so we cannot allow wages to grow. Well, okay. You know, they have the power to do it, and they have done it, and they're doing it right now. So if you wonder why we are impoverished, it's because we have an agency, an unelected agency, that can control our wages, can say, yeah, you can't make that. <laughs> you can't make it. We'll take it away from you. This is such an exciting topic. I think we've struck a nerve here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one thing I, I wanted to, to just say a little bit, too, in the thing is that... Uh, you know, with, with respect to population, it seems to me the main reason the government needs to be concerned about it is because, you know, of our, our social safety net programs are, are somewhat of a pyramid scheme, and so we need to keep having more bodies feeding into it in order to support those at the top. And, and I, you know, it, it just seems to me if, if we weren't concerned about that, then the right number of people is whatever the market produces, I guess, you know, I mean, that's... that's and and there would be no such thing as prices being beyond... Uh, the means of, of the ability to pay. Uh, and so when we look at where prices have gone beyond the ability to pay, where has it been? It's been in housing. Well, government provides all of the, uh, in fact, there's a great, uh, uh, the new nominee for uh, the, the Consumer Protection Agency. Anyway, he's got a whole different view of what will happen with mortgages. But you, when you look at what happened with housing, when you look at what happened with health care, when you look at what happened with education, and these are the three uh, millstones around the middle class neck, they're all government subsidized and those prices were subsidized higher. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really, when you think about you know, productivity, if, if instead of needing two, person, I only, two people, I only need one, instead of paying two people $100,000, well, I may only need one person, but they're going to make $80,000. Philip, you shed light on this. <laughs> <laughs> you make rain, you make light. Baltimore woman uses uh, the gun buyback program in Baltimore, uh, to buyback cash program, to buy a bigger gun. I, I, smart lady, as far as I can tell. Yeah, it just goes to the, I, I guess, the unintended consequences of some of these programs. I, uh, you know, the, I, I saw the video clip, and the woman who was interviewed said that, you know, well, she had a 9 millimeter gun that she was bringing in, and said, what are you going to, the, the reporter said, what are you going to do with the money that you get? And she said, I'm going to go buy a bigger gun. <laughs> and and then not, not only that, too, but there were some other odd incentives in the program. They talked about having a $25 clip, uh, high-capacity clip, uh, uh, you know, uh, amount of money that they'd given. But the actual purchase price was lower than the $25. So there was this perverse incentive that you could so actually So people were go, going on the internet buying yes, clips? Yes, you could go buy the, the clip for less money than <laughs> and Sell make a profit, yeah. which is, is completely, a, it's just a, a, an odd uh, distribution of resources, a distorted distribution of resources by the state in the end. <laughs> so. In, in uh, uh, exercise as good at drugs, as drugs, as cutting high blood pressure. Is that true? I, well, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my opinion, and then you, you, you tell me yours first. You're a big nutritionist guy, right? Uh, kind of. Yeah, okay. Mine first? Yeah. Uh, I have all, every bad, I have all the bad habits. I, I drink coffee, I drink beer, wine, and 
smoke cigarettes, and I'm the only one in my family that does not have high blood pressure. And why? And in fact, I'm under not a single medication, and I'm 62 years old. Um, how did it work? It, because I have always exercised all my life, and I was a, a chubby kid, later on wasn't chubby, ran marathons, smoking two packs a day, no problem. To this minute, I do not have a single physical ailment. And, uh, you know, a study came out not long ago where they finally, you know, kind of copped to it. And they said, look, if you have to choose about lifestyle, um, if you look at the risk factors that, you know, are in our society now, by controlling what you eat, um, by, you know, not smoking, by not doing whatever is considered a vice, uh, you can, at the margin, affect about 10%. So if you have a 100% of chance of getting a heart attack, do all of that, live perfectly, live like a monk, and you've got a 90% chance of having a heart attack. On the other hand, if you just exercise, you can do anything, anything, and your chances are reduced your risk by 90 percent. Ten percent versus ninety. So in other words, if I was supposed to have a heart attack, if I had a hundred percent chance of heart, having a heart attack and I lived the light of an esthete, I could reduce it by ten percent. However, I can live whatever life I want to live, and as long as I exercise religiously, I will have I have a ninety I've reduced my risk by ninety percent. And all I can tell you is if there's anybody that's just sitting here as a living example of that uh, you know, knock on wood, if, uh, but, um, but I can say that just looking at my family and looking at my family history and all of that, the one thing that is exceptional that I have done is exercise every day. You know, I think uh, our, similar, our experiences are somewhat similar. I, uh, 50 pounds ago and uh, uh, <clears throat> before I started running marathons, uh, I uh, had to take high blood pressure medicine uh, because I had high blood pressure. And I said, to hell with this. And so I started uh, running marathons. And I started, uh, you know, doing 10,000 steps a day and, you know, the whole nine yards, doing a regular uh, exercise program. And my uh, blood pressure today was 126 over 82 with no medicine. Right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I think, I think that exercise is key for a whole lot of uh, health benefits. What you eat is important, too. If you stay away from the flour and the sugar, that makes a big difference. I, I have been told that, but I'm a red meat and donuts guy. I didn't say anything about red uh, meat. Uh, uh, red meat is fine. I'm just uh, talking about the refined... refined. Uh, and I would add, just to be you know the devil's advocate a little bit, one thing that I did, if I had to do it over again, uh, is there are people who are fanatic exercisers. I, I do believe in that. I'm all my, all of, uh, whatever problems I have physically came from exercise. Uh, you know, things were like injuries. Yeah. And so as I got older and I, you know, stopped competing, all I wanted to do was make sure I could do what I did last year. That was basically always my goal. Like yeah. If you could do what you did last year, yeah. you didn't get old. Uh, and so what I found is things that are really low impact, I do them every day and they do their job, but I don't, for instance, run anymore. That's where I, I actually, you know, I had a lot of injuries. Yeah. Uh, Use it or lose it. <laughs> yeah, more than football. I, you know, I got, I, was, I got injured more running than I ever did with football. That's the show. Uh, we'll run it, we'll run out the clock. Uh, and I'll see you again next week on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show.